Wretched to think of the discomfort she must have undergone. Think of the damp, and her chest was always delicate. <laughs> and the frogs. Oh. I never shall enjoy any peace of mind until I know why Iolanthe went to live among the frogs. Then why not summon her and ask her? Why? Because if I set eyes on her, I should forgive her at once. Then why not forgive her? Twenty-five years, it's a long time. Think how we loved her. Loved her? What was your love to mine? 
Why, she was invaluable to me. Who taught me to curl myself inside a buttercup? I, Olanthe. Who taught me to swing upon a cobweb? I, Olanthe. Who taught me to dive into a dewdrop? To nestle in a nutshell? To gamble upon gossamer? I, Olanthe. She certainly did surprising things. Oh, give her back to us, great queen, for your sake, if not for ours. Oh, I should be strong, but I am weak. I should be marble, but I am clay. Her punishment has been heavier than I intended. I did not mean that she should go and live among the frogs. And, well, well, it shall be as you wish. It shall be as you wish. That stream to be near my son Strafford. Oh, bless my heart. 
I didn't know you had a son. He was born soon after I left my husband by your royal command. <laughs> but he doesn't even know of his father's existence. Oh. How old is he? Twenty-four. Oh. <laughs> No one to look at you would think you had a son of 24. But that's one of the advantages of being immortal. We never grow old. Is it pretty? Oh, it's extremely pretty. Oh. It is inclined to be stout. Oh. Oh. I see no objection to stoutness. In moderation. And what is he? He's an Arcadian shepherd. And he loves Philip, a board in Chancery. Mere shepherd! And he, half a fairy. He's a fairy down to the waist. But his legs are mortal. Dear yeah, me! I have no reason to suppose that I am more curious than other people. But I must confess I should like to see a person who's a fairy down to the waist, but whose legs are mortal. Oh, oh, nothing easier. He answers me, a oh, shepherd lad is no fit helpmate for a ward of chancery. I stood in court, and there I sang him songs of Arcady with flagellant accompaniments in vain. At first he seemed amused, oh, so did the bar, but quickly wearing of my song and pipe, he bade me get out. A servile usher then, in crumpled bands and rusty bombazine, led me, still singing, into chancery lane. I'll go no more. I'll marry her today and brave the upshot, be it what it may. Oh, <laughs> who are these? Oh, Strephon rejoiced with me. My queen has pardoned me. Pardoned you, mother? This is good news indeed. And these ladies are my beloved sisters. Your sisters? Then they are my aunts. A pleasant piece of news for your bride on her wedding day. Hush! My bride knows nothing of my fairyhood. I dare not tell her lest it frighten her. She thinks me mortal, and prefers me so. Your fairyhood doesn't seem to have done you much good. Much good? My dear aunt, it's the curse of my existence. What's the use of being half a fairy? <laughs> my body can crawl through a keyhole, but what's the good of that when my legs are left kicking behind? I can make myself invisible down to the waist, but what's the use of that when my legs remain exposed to view? My brain is a fairy brain, but from the waist downwards I'm a gibbering idiot. My upper half is immortal, but my lower half grows older every day, and some day or other must die of old age. What's to become of my upper half when I've buried my lower half? I really don't know. Oh, I see your difficulty. But with a fairy brain, you should seek an intellectual sphere of action. Let me see. I'm a borough or two at my disposal. Would you like to go into Parliament? Oh, a fairy member! <laughs> that would be delightful. Oh, no, I'm afraid I should do no good there. You see, down to the waist, I'm a Tory of the most determined description. But my legs are a couple of confounded radicals. And on a division, they'd be sure to take me into the wrong lobby. You see, they're two to one, which is a strong working majority. <laughs> Don't let that distress you. You shall be returned as a liberal conservative. And your legs shall be our peculiar curse. 
I see your majesty does not do things by heart. No, we are fairies down to the feet. Chancellor himself by that time. Yes, he's a clean old gentleman. <laughs> As it is, half the House of Lords is sighing at your feet. The House of Lords are certainly extremely attentive. Attentive? I should think they were. Why did five and twenty liberal peers come down to shoot over your grass plot last autumn? Don't tell me it was the sparrows. Why did five and twenty conservative peers come down to fish in your pond? Don't tell me it was the goldfish. <laughs> No, no. Delays are dangerous. And if we're to marry, the sooner the better. Within the beating, 
my love that heart and shrine, my heart within the beating, my love.
of everything that's excellent. It has no kind of fault or flaw, and I'm a lord to body the law. The constitutional guardian I of pity young walls in Charles Sarai, all very agreeable girls, and none are over the age of twenty-one. <laughs> a pleasant occupation for a rather susceptible Johnson law. <laughs> And though the compliment implied inflates me with legitimate pride, it nevertheless can't be denied that it has its inconvenient side. I'm not so old, and I'm not so vain, and I'm quite prepared to marry again. But there'd be the dues to pay, and the lords if I fell in love with one of the wars. Which rather tries my temper for I'm such a susceptible chance along Which rather tries my temper for I'm such a susceptible chance along And everyone who'd marry a ward Must come to me for my accord And in my court I sit all day Giving agreeable girls away With one for him and one for he And one for you and one for ye and one for them, and one for me, but never, never do one to me. Which is exasperating for, and such as a simple chance alone. Which is exasperating for, and such as a simple chance alone. By all means, Phyllis, who is a ward of court, has so powerfully affected your lordships that you have appealed to me in a body to give it to whichever one of you she may think proper to select. And a noble lord has just now gone to a cottage to request her immediate attendance. It would be idle to deny that I myself have the misfortune to be singularly attracted by this young person. My regard for her is rapidly undermining the constitution. Three months ago, I was a stout man. I need say no more. 
If I could reconcile it with my sense of duty, I would unhesitatingly award her to <laughs> Michel. But I can conscientiously say that I know no man who is so wealthy for to render her exceptionally happy. <laughs> but such an award would be open to misconstruction, and therefore at whatever personal inconvenience, I waive my claim. My lord, I desire on the part of this house to express its sincere sympathy with your lordship's most painful position. Oh, I thank your lordships. Are the feelings of a lord chancellor who isn't under the board of court are not to be envied? Oh, what is his position? Can he give his own consent to his own marriage with his own ward? Can he marry his own ward without his own consent? And if he marry his own ward without his own consent, can he commit himself for contempt of his own court? And if he commit himself for contempt of his own court, can he appear by counsel before himself to move for the rest of his own judgment? <laughs> ah, my lords, it is indeed painful to have to sit upon a wool sack which is stuffed with such thorns as these. My lords, I have much pleasure in announcing that I have succeeded in inducing the young person to present herself at the bar of this house. and rarest. Her origin's lowly, it's true, but of birth and position I've plenty. I've gravel and spelling for two, and blood and behavior for twenty. Oh.
not with love affected, not meet with virtue scorn the well connected. High rank involves no shame, we boast an equal claim, we have a humble name to be respected. Take her, we command you. 
She's written in heaven by the bright barber Darth that leaps forth with lurid light from each grim thundercloud. The very rain pours forth her sad and sodden sympathy. When chorus nature bids me take my love, shall I reply nay, but a certain chancellor forbids it? Sir, you are England's Lord High Chancellor, but are you Chancellor of Birds and Trees, King of the Winds and Prince of Thunderclouds? No. It's a nice point. I don't know that I ever met it before. But my difficulty is that at present there is no evidence before the court that Corey's nature has interested herself in the matter. No evidence? You have my word for it. I tell you she bade me take my love. Ah, but the good sir, you mustn't tell us what she told you. <laughs> That's not evidence. Now. An affidavit from a thunderstorm, or a few words on oath from a heavy shower, that meet with all the attention they deserve. But can you apply the prosaic rules of evidence to a case which bubbles over with poetical emotion? Distinctly. I have always kept my duty strictly before my eyes, and it is to that fact that I owe my advancement to my present distinguished position. <laughs> When I went to the bar as a very young man, said I to myself, said I, I'll work on a new and original plan, said I to myself, said I, I will never assume that a rogue or a thief is a gentleman worthy implicit belief, because his attorney has sent me a brief, said I to myself, said I. There I go into court, I will read my brief through, said I to myself, said I, and I'll never take work I'm unable to do, said I to myself, said I, my learned profession I'll never disgrace by taking a fee with a grin on the face when I haven't been there to attend your case, said I to myself, said I. I will never throw dust in a juryman's eye, said I to myself, said I. Or who'd think a judge is not ever wise, said I to myself, said I. Or assume that the witnesses summoned in force and exchequer, Queen's Bench, Common Pleas or Divorce, have perjured themselves as a matter of course, said I to myself, said I. In other professions in which men engage, said I to myself, said I. The army, the navy, the church, and the stage. Out, damn spot! Said I to myself, said I. Professional license, if carried too far, your chance of promotion will certainly mar. And I fancy the rule might apply to a bar, said I to myself, said I. <laughs> Phyllis, to be taken from you just when I was on the point of making you my own. Oh, it's too much. It's too much. My son in tears. And on his wedding day. My wedding day? Oh, Mother, weep with me, for the law has interposed between us, and the Lord Chancellor has separated us forever. The Lord Chancellor? Oh, if he did but know. If he did but know what? No matter. The Lord Chancellor has no power over you. Remember, you are half a fairy. You can defy him. Down to the waist. Yes, but from the waist downwards, he can commit me to prison for years. Of what avail is it when my body is free, if my legs are working out seven years' penal servitude? True. But take heart. Our Queen has promised you her special protection. I'll go to her and lay your peculiar case before her. My beloved mother, how can I repay the debt I owe you? I 
think I heard him say that on the rainy day, to while the time away on her he'd call. Thou shouldst need an ark, I'll give thee one. What was that? I heard the minx remark, she'd meet him after dark, inside St. James's Park and give him one. I heard the minx remark, she'd meet him after dark, inside St. James's Park and give him one. Prospects not so bad, my heart's so sore and sad. Maybe I'll soon be glad as I'll be sad. Oh, when the sky is dark and tempest breaks my heart, if it all should be a march, I'll give you one. I'll give you one. Ladies, my mother. This lady's his mom. This lady's my mother. This lady's his mom. He says she's his mother. <laughs> <laughs> what means this mirth unseemly that shakes the listening earth? The joke is good extremely and justifies our birth. This gentleman is seen with a maid of seventeen and taking of his dog chain by the ankle and wonders in the chief for he asks to believe she's his mother and is nearly five and twenty. Recollect yourself, I pray, and be careful what you say, as the ancient Roman said, Vesgaina Lente. For I really do not see how so young a girl could be the mother of a man of five and twenty. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Often wished I had some myself. But with the House of Peers composed exclusively of people of intellect, what's to become of the House of Commons? We never thought of that. All this comes of women interfering in politics. It so happens it is an institution in Great Britain which is not susceptible of any improvement whatsoever. It is the House of Peers.
pierced with holes its legislative hand. And the noble statesman do not itch to interfere with matters which they do not understand. As bright will shine great Britain's rays as in a king George's glorious days. As bright will shine great Britain's rays. Now, here is a man whose physical attributes are simply 
godlike. That man has a most extraordinary effect upon me. If I yielded to a natural impulse, I should fall down and worship that man. But I mortify this inclination. I wrestle with it, and it lies beneath my feet. That is how I treat my regard for that man. Then, my darling, my own. Well, have you settled which it's to be? 
Not altogether. It's a difficult position. It would be hardly delicate to toss up. On the whole, we would rather leave it to you. How could it possibly concern me? You are both earls, and you are both rich, and you are both plain. <laughs> so we are. At least I am. So am I. No, no. No, I am indeed very plain. Oh, well, perhaps you are. There's really nothing to choose between you. If one of you were to forego his title and distribute his estates among his Irish tenantry, why then I should see a reason for accepting the other. Uh, Talon, are you prepared to make this sacrifice? No. Not even to oblige a lady? No. Not even to oblige a lady. Well, the only question is, which one of us shall give way to the other? Perhaps on the whole, she'd be happier with me. I don't know, I may be wrong. No, I don't think you are. I really believe she would. But the awkward part of the thing is, that if you rob me of the girl of my heart, we must fight, and one of us must die. It's a family tradition that I've sworn to respect. It's a painful position. I have a very strong regard for you, George. My dear Thomas, you are very dear to me, George. We were boys together. At least I was. <laughs> if I were to survive you, my existence would be hopelessly embittered. Then, my dear Thomas, you must not do it. I say it again and again. If it will have this effect on you, you must not do it. No, no. If one of us is to destroy the other, let it be me. No, no. Ah, yes, by our boyish friendship, I implore you. Well, well, be it so. But no, I cannot consent to an act which would crush you with unavailing remorse. But it would not do so. Oh, I should be very sad at first. Who would not be? But it would wear off. I like you very much, but not perhaps as much as you like me. George, you're a noble fellow, but that telltale tear betrays you. No, George, you are very fond of me, and I cannot consent to give you a week's uneasiness on my account. But dear Thomas, it would not last a week. Remember, you lead the House of Lords on your demise, I shall take your place. Why, Thomas, it would not last a day. Now, I do hope you're not going to fight about me, because it's really not worthwhile. Well, I don't believe it is. Nora, the sacred ties of friendship are paramount. Oh, perhaps I may incur your blame, but things of you I would not do in friendship's name. And I may say I feel the same, not even love should rank above true friendship's name.
unrequited robs me of the rest. Love, hopeless love, my ardent soul encumbers. Love, nightmare-like, lies heavy on my chest. And weaves itself into my midlife's long. When you're lying awake with a dismal headache and repose with trouble by anxiety, I can see him may use any language you choose to indulge in without impropriety. For your brain is on fire, the bedclothes conspire, of usual slumber to plumb to you. First a counterpane goes and uncovers your toes, then your sheet slips demurely from under you. The blanketing tickles you feel like mixed pickles, so terribly sharp is the picking. And you're hot and you're cross and you tumble and toss till there's nothing next to you and the ticking. And the bedclothes all peek to the ground in a heap and you pick them all up in a tangle. Next to pillow resigns and the light of decline to remain at its usual angle. But you get some repose in the form of a dose of hot eyeballs and head ever aching. That you're slumbering in such horrible dreams that it very much better you be waking. For you dream you are crossing the channels and tossing the mountain of steam up and marriage. But you're something between a large bathing machine and a very small second class carriage. And you're giving a treat, petty ice and cold meat to a party of friends and relations. There are ravenous hall and they all came aboard at Red Square and South Kensington stations. And round on that journey, you find your attorney who started that morning from Devon. He's a bit undersized, and you don't feel surprised when he tells you he's only eleven. Well, you're driving like mad with this singular lad by the by the ship's now four wheeler. And you're playing round games, and he calls you bad names, and you tell him that ties pay the dealer. But this you can't stand, so you throw up your hand, and you find you're as cold as an icicle. In your shirt and your socks and black suit, you've got cross and swords, but it's there like a bicycle. And even the crew on bicycles too, they somehow or other invested in. And he's telling the tars or the particulars of a company he's interested in. It's a scheme of devices to get at low prices of goods from cop mixes to cables, which tickle the sailors by treating retailers as though they were all vegetables. You get a good space, but a plant a small trace and has take off his boots with a boot tree. And his legs will take root and his fingers will shoot and they'll blossom and bud like a fruit tree. From the green roots of tree you get grapes and green pea, cauliflower, pineapples and cranberries. For the pastry book down, cherry brown. And you will grab them for pops and three and bad for this. The shares are a penny and ever so many are taken by Rothschild and Bearding. And just as if you were allotted to you, you'll wait for the shot of his bed. You're a regular big with a trick in your neck and a bun for your snore for your head on the floor and the needles and fix in your soles to your shoes and your fetches and keep your legs and sleep and you grab when your toes and a fly on your nose. So cough and you're with a fever, he's done and a curse and sense and a general sense that you haven't been sleeping in clover. But the darkness is past in its daylight and flaws, and the night has been on to do, to do my song. And thank goodness that the hope of the whole. Ah, my lords, it is seldom that a Lord Chancellor has reason to envy the position of another, but I am free to confess that I would rather be too old and engaged to Phyllis than any other half dozen noblemen upon the face of the globe. Yes, it's an enviable position when you're the only one. Oh, yes, no doubt most enviable. At the same time, seeing you thus, we naturally say to ourselves, this is very sad. His lordship is constitutionally as blithe as a bird. He trills upon the bench like a thing of song and gladness. His series of judgments in F sharp minor, given on Dante in six eight time, are among the most remarkable effects ever produced in the court of chancery. He is perhaps the only living instance of a judge whose decrees have received the honor of a double encore. <laughs> Oh, how could we do that which would deprive the Court of Chancery of one of its most attractive features? I feel the force of your remarks, but I am here in two capacities, and they clash, my lord, they clash. I deeply grieve to say that in declining my last application to myself, I presumed to address myself in terms which render it impossible for me ever to apply to myself again. It was a most painful scene, my lords. 
most painful. This is what it is to have two capacities. Let us be thankful that we are persons of no capacity whatever. Come, come. Remember, you are a very just and kindly old gentleman, and you need have no hesitation in approaching yourself, so that you do so respectfully and with a proper show of deference. Do you really think so? I do. Well, I'll nerve myself to another effort, and if that fails, I resign myself to my fate. <laughs> If you go in, you're sure to win. Yours will be a charming lady, be your lord. The ancient saw, faint heart, never won. Fair lady, never, 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 faint heart, never won. Fair lady. Every journey has an end. When I go worst affairs with men, dawn the dawn when day is nigh. Hustle your horse and don't say die. At such a price, he's not worth a man of me. Be so kind to bear in mind, faith has never won. Never, 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 faith has never won. Never, 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 never
centuries or so? Oh, she wears well. <laughs> she does. She's a fairy. I beg your pardon? A what? Oh, I have no longer any reason to conceal the fact. She's a fairy. A fairy? Well, but that would account for a good many things. Then I suppose you're a fairy. <laughs> I'm half a fairy. Which half? The upper half. Down to the waistcoat. Dear me! Oh, <laughs> nothing to show oh, Don't do that! But why didn't you tell me this before? Well, I thought you would take a dislike to me. But as it's all off, you may as well know the truth. I'm only half a mortal. I'd much rather have half a mortal I do love than half a dozen I don't. I think not. Go to your half dozen. It's only two and I hate them. Please forgive me. I don't think I ought to. Besides, all sorts of difficulties will arise. You know, my grandmother looks just as young as my mother. And so do all my aunts. I quite understand. Whenever I see you kissing a very young lady... I should know it's an elderly relative. <laughs> you will. Then, Phyllis, I think we shall be very happy. We won't wait long. We might change our minds. We'll get married first. And change our minds afterwards? That's the usual course. <laughs> We're weak enough to turn the air We marry you and I On the feeling I inspire You may tire by and by For peace is flowing from the stress That on the side is why I'm sure we should not tarry Ere we marry you and I We're weak enough to turn the air We marry you and I Here's the more of I mean, is she aware of our engagement? 
daughter-in-law. She kisses just like other people. <laughs> but what about the Lord Chancellor? Oh, I forgot him. Mother, none can resist your fairy eloquence. You will go to him and plead for us. No, no, impossible. But our happiness, our very lives depend upon our obtaining his consent. Oh, madam, you cannot refuse to do this. You know not what you ask. The Lord Chancellor is my husband. Your, your husband? husband? My husband. And your father. Then, of course, he's quite plain. On his learning that Strephon is his son, all objections to our marriage will be at once removed. Nay, he must never know. He believes me to have died childless. And dearly as I love him, I am bound under penalty of death not to undeceive him. Success has crowned my efforts, and I may consider myself engaged to Phyllis. <laughs> at first I wouldn't hear of it, it was out of the question, but I took heart. I pointed out to myself that I was no stranger to myself, that in point of fact, I had been personally acquainted with myself for some years. This had its effect. I admitted that I had watched my professional advancement with considerable interest, and I handsomely added that I yielded to no one in admiration for my private and professional virtues. Oh, this was a great point game. I then endeavoured to work upon my feelings. Conceive my joy when I distinctly perceived a tear glistening in my own eye. Eventually, after a severe struggle with myself, I reluctantly, almost reluctantly, consented. <laughs> My lord, a suppliant at your feet I kneel. Oh, listen to a mother's fond appeal. Hear me to light, I come in urgent need. Tis for my Oh, young Strephon, that I plead. Hear if in the bygone years thine eyes have ever shed tears, it It shall be soon. 
those who would separate us will be tied. My doom, my lips have spoken. I plead in vain. A fall already broken. I break again. recruited entirely from persons of intelligence. I really don't see what use we are down here. Do you, Talala? None whatever. Good. Then away we go to Fairyland. <laughs> Sky 
high, ever so high. Pleasures come in endless series. We will arrange happy exchange. House of beers, our house of beer is beer is beer is beer is house of beers, our house of beer is. Up in the air, sky high, sky high, free from wolves in charms and lies. I will be surely happy for it's such a susceptible chance. So long, up in the air, sky high, sky high, free from wolves in charms and lies. I will be surely happy for it's such a susceptible chance. So long, up in the air, sky high.